it's an honor to be with the Showtime series star, City on the Hill, Lauren E. Banks. It's such an amazing experience to talk with you and to let us know about, you know, your character and your role and your experience in this series, especially season two. Honored to be here with you, Hannah Joy. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So I would here. love, <laughs> yeah, this virtual experience. Um, I would love for you to tell us to begin with a little bit about what it was like graduating from Yale Drama School in 2017 and then landing this role on, you know, for City on the Hill. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> it was crazy and it was uh, gratifying for sure. I had a, I put in a lot of time, I guess, into training. So I trained at Yale Drama, which is three years. I was at Howard as a theater major for four years and um, even my high school experience was really a professionally driven um, training program. So um, to be able to graduate and to get things rolling so so quickly out of the gate was a lot of fun. And um, I, sitting on a hill, came up, I was, I was getting ready for my first uh, pilot season and um, I had auditioned for the show in LA and I got back, gotten back to New York and on like a red eye and I was exhausted from a week of meetings and you know, just kind of prepping for pilot season and just bracing myself, so I thought. And um, around 12 noon, I woke up to a whole lot of missed calls about City on the Hill, Showtime, I really love my audition. Um, and they're doing a call back, but because I just gone back, they were just like, okay, well, they're gonna use your tape um, for the call back. And about three days later, I was on my way to Boston for the first time to shoot the pilot, meeting Aldis, meeting Kevin, and Aldis and I became husband and wife overnight, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and with the three, four year long history. So it was, it was a pretty wild ride and it kind of has continued to be. So attending Howard University and HBCU, yes. then Yale University, please describe both of those educational experiences sure. um, along with their similarities and their differences. Well, that's the first thing that I noticed actually about Yale was the similarities to um, what I experienced at Howard in terms of their training program, right? And, and Ron Van Loo, who was the head of the acting program at Yale at the time that I attended, um, uh, Yale's philosophy on the program being focused on who they invite to teach and who they invite to learn and everything else is just real estate and so because they invested so much in those two things I think it made for a really strong program we didn't always have believe it or not even at Yale all of the best facilities and you know state of the, of the art um, buildings if you will because a lot of it was like you know historical buildings that they maintained but um, but the, the, the spirit of um, generosity that permeated those walls and um, the teachers and the instructors who gave us their all uh, was very resonant of my experience at Howard. And a lot of why I chose Yale over any of the other um, professional training programs for grad school. And, um, and then difference wise, of course, you know, HBCU is an HBCU and there's no other experience like it. Um, walking across the yard, you know, on a Friday is there is no other place like it. And um, it's very specifically a, um, a place that I think the myth, the myth, if you will, is that you go to college and you pick a PWI so that you can figure out how to get along with with them and them being the majority, right? And the truth is you go to college to figure out who you are and to, um, and to find what your strengths are. And that's what I was able to do at Howard in addition to training. And, um, and I was just, it, you know, I was very, very happy that I made that choice and yeah. Yeah, I, I think they love on you at an HBCU a little bit hard here. <laughs> love, yes, in the best way possible and also in the way that you're like, oh my God, I have to go home. Like, 
Yeah. I know you love me and I know you want me to go out and succeed, but dag, yep. you're tripping something serious here. So, you know, yeah. so. Uh, you, found, you find your sisters, your aunties, your uncles, all of that, all of that at the HB. So we have to, you know, I'm glad you, you did a shout out. So, <laughs> so it's really a good experience and I, I encourage it. I'm glad we're on the same page about yeah. it. Yeah. Did you go to HBCU as well? I did. I did. Um, Xavier University of Louisiana. Xavier, of course. You don't have to tell yeah. me, but yes. <laughs> yeah, and that New Orleans life is something something special. <laughs> I bet. I bet. That's beautiful. But yeah, um, to continue on with this interview, um, while being in the Showtime series City on a Hill, what was it like playing the private attorney, Siobhan, especially realizing how many minorities have been falsely accused mm -hmm. and some do not have the funds or the resources to afford an attorney? How did that like, you know, how did that feel emotionally and, you know, yeah. especially, you know, seeing that maybe every day? Yeah, you definitely see it every day. And I've definitely seen it even on, you know, in the organizing space. And, um, and I have family members who quite frankly have um, had the experience of not being able to afford proper representation and, and taking some really shoddy deals or just having a, just horrible experiences um, with the judicial system because of it. Um, being able to play Siobhan, obviously, therefore, is very gratifying in that she does get to pick and choose. She has a career path uh, that has allowed her to do pro bono work, and um, as well as if she is very much interested in cultivating a um, healthier community in Boston for African Americans in the 90s, and which was very necessary, and a lot of, and you know, it is reminiscent of the real life story of the various um, members of the clergy and, and other officials um, in the community who made a concerted effort to to help the youth specifically. Um, so it's, it's, it's great and it's necessary. And I think, you know, it makes for a complicated journey for Siobhan because she is trying to figure out what her purpose is and how best to serve her community. Thank you for that response. Yeah. What was it like working with Aldous Hodge and Kevin Bacon. Pretty fantastic. Um, Aldis and Kevin both are, you know, they, they've literally been doing this their whole lives, almost. And, in special, and they both have been doing it since before the age of 18. So, you know, in many ways, um, grew up doing it. And um, that's not my experience. So, so I get to learn a, a great deal from both of them. Um, and they're veterans in their own way. Um, Aldis obviously plays my husband and DeCourcy and, and, um, and the characters Siobhan and DeCourcy challenge each other a lot and, and Aldis and I both also challenge each other um, respectfully and, art, and artfully and I also think just playfully, you know, so we, we have to keep it light because it is a tense environment when you're talking about Boston 90s. Um, married couple, Boston 90s, you know, married couple who are black who have to go out every day and deal with racism and stuff like that. So that's a thing. And then with Kevin, his character is like very much kind of holds down the villain space in our show. Um, you know, he's not completely a villain, obviously. He's much more complicated than that. But uh, Kevin's character, Jackie Roar, is so gritty and ugly um, sometimes, a lot of the time. But Kevin's spirit of generosity with playing Jackie is so, um, Effect, infectious and so just charming almost <laughs> and it's like you you know kind of interesting kind of dynamic to play when we're working with you know within scenes but I learn a lot for those guys and I have a good time showing up to work at 4 30 in the morning to, to do so so it's a good thing that's good that you love what you do yes it is a blessing it's huge it's important that you love what you do and you said waking up at 4 30 in the morning at least word. That, mm -hmm. that is sometimes such, 345 yeah yeah that's such a blessing because there are so many people that go to work angry upset but you go you, you you're happy you're happy I, I am it's it's a beautiful thing I teach my kids all the time um my kids being students that I train <laughs> I'm not a mother <laughs> I call them my kids but I you know I when I am 
you know, training young people from my high school or to get ready to go to college, particularly Howard, and, you know, or college to prepare for grad school, um, you know, I just tell them to be really clear about what it is, what their definition of success is, because that is what's going to make them happy, not somebody else's um, portrayal of success or their what they see, but what what makes you happy and then define success based on those things. So, yeah. That's true. You're dropping gems. <laughs> and so in, in this series, we see so many situations where we still see discrimination and civil unrest in the mm-hmm. series, but also in 2020, we saw that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was devastating to be a woman of color and to see what was going on in our society. I'm like, this can't be, this can't be it. This can't be it, especially during my during my generation, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it it really upset me. And so in the series, we saw Grace Campbell, a community activist. She intervenes when Madeline Wilson is stopped and arrested by the police mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because of crack cocaine in her vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to ask you, what would you say to someone who has been in prison for a crime they did not commit? What would I personally say or mm-hmm. my character say? What would mm-hmm. I say? Right. Um, you know, it's tough, right? I'll say, I'll say this. I'll say it's two parts for me. I think when people are wrongfully convicted or wrongfully accused in Madeline Wilson's case in our show, she's wrongfully accused. And, and thankfully, because of the concerted effort of characters like Siobhan um, that I play, she is not convicted. Whereas most times a young woman who is set up in that way because she was set up by somebody in her community um, and and the FBI gets involved to try to turn her, you know, to be a, a scapegoat or um, snitch for lack of better words, um, it kind of goes the other way. I think that it is important um, for people who are wrongfully convicted to share their story, quite frankly. Um, I know a lot of my fellow colleagues are working around the clock, you know, as we speak to help exonerate people who have been wrongfully convicted in in real life. Um, And then I also say, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I've not been wrongfully convicted of anything, but I have organized and I have protested and I have found myself in a jail cell for protesting. And I found myself in a jail cell with a felony charge and I've, you know, walked around for two and a half weeks contemplating the possibility that I would have a felony or I could be convicted of a felony when I know for sure my act of protest did not, did not include um, what the police officers had charged us with that day. Thankfully, because of a lot of people, those charges were dropped for me and the people that were um, protesting and acting in this act of civil disobedience. But it is not a beautiful, <laughs> happy place to be. It is a very, um, it's a very frightening place to be. And and I've empathized deeply with people who have been wrongfully convicted because their lives are taken from them. And um, it happens every day, unfortunately. Uh, right, and that just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. And I, I think even when someone lies on me, I, I still feel like some type of way. I, I still feel some type of way. I know it's not to that extent, but I still feel. Um, well, part of your freedom is taken away when someone. Exactly. Right? Yeah, your exactly. freedom to, to self determine and, and, and to, to be honest in who you are, and somebody paints a picture otherwise. Right. And so in the series, Siobhan wants to start a family and, you know, bring a child in this world. Mm-hmm. And so. Do you believe it becomes difficult for parents to now think about having that conversation, um, whether their child gets pulled over by the police and how to act, you know, when the police stops you? Do you think that becomes a fear factor? For her at that time Mm -hmm. or today? I mean, both, both. I think, I think, you know, the, the unfortunate part about it all, but yet fortunate in some silver lining is that things have not changed, right? And I think the opportunity we have on the show, because we are telling uh, a show that's based on true events, is to show how people dealt with such an experience, right? Um, Such experiences, how um, Boston in particular 
were, were able to come together where they didn't just depend on their lawmakers or their um, or their elected officials to get the job done. But in fact, as we're seeing in, in our own communities all across the country, people are getting involved who didn't think they had a, a part to play in the fight, right? And in terms of making change. Um, and and that it the work that we have to do is is a incumbent upon us all to be aware um, and then not just aware, but then be involved in some kind of way, especially when we are bumped up against a world that we um, no longer wish to exist within or circumstances that, that um, do not affirm our freedoms, right? So I think, um, I think for families and parents that experience young people being pulled over. And I think the talk is, you know, very much the same. I, I know I have a plan for when I get pulled over. I know I've shared it. I know people that I'm going to contact right away. I know that I'm going to be recording, you know, when it happens, unfortunately, that is necessary. And um, yeah, I think, but I think, I think it has to happen until it, it becomes obsolete. And, and hopefully, whether we're on screen or in real life, we're doing the work to, to make that happen important to do the work <laughs> it's important to do the work but it's also like you said we have to have a plan for protection and even for our kids and even for those who you know who we're teaching and we're mentoring things like that that's so important to have a plan and you know yeah. not just oh i'm gonna figure it out no 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 it's no it's not i i live in la right and <laughs> My first time experiencing the earthquake, I said, oh my God, I'm going to die, <laughs> right? And then, and then I didn't, uh, thankfully, right? But it was a very big earthquake and I had no plan. But so then I said, okay, what, what would I do in the case that the roof caves in like I thought it was going to do? Oh, I Google it. It says get under a table, a sturdy table, whatever, whatever, right? Point is, um, I think it's very important for people to to do so, to protect ourselves. I don't think we can continue to actually live in a world where, where we blind ourselves or our children um, from the, the fact that domestic terrorism exists. It does, everywhere. And it, it does, does not serve ourselves or anybody else to pretend as if it doesn't. Um, it's happening for our community in terms of black communities. It's happening for Asian American communities, brown communities all over everybody is experiencing it and, and, and nobody is exempt from it. Young people, young children can't go to elementary school without, you know, that experience of, of, of um, violence. So I think it's, 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 it's important and it's incumbent upon everybody to be prepared, but then also not just be prepared and act in fear, but be proactive and get a, ahead of the things that happen and why they happen and then change them. And so we noticed that your character is also dominant, witty, and her voice will not be si it will not be silenced in the workplace. So Siobhan will not. And so, <laughs> and so, can you shed light on the beauty and the difficulty women experience in the workplace? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, mm. <laughs> thankfully you know the work that i've been able to do it, it has been in film and television and theater and for the most part almost i, I honestly i can't even recall a, a a bad experience as it relates to being a woman in the workplace but it is challenging right and and there are nuances and there are microaggressions that exist as a woman in the workplace and it is important just like my character to um have a sense of self a sense of awareness and to not not definitely not play the victim but certainly also don't think that you have to be a happy to be there or b um that you have to that people have to um like you necessarily i think I think it's much more important to be respected um, as a human being in this world for who you are and um, and to be articulate and and um, and to hold yourself gracefully like Siobhan's character Siobhan's name means God, um, God's grace and I and I think I when I learned that even when I 
first read the pilot to audition for the piece, I took that into the room and I take that into my character to move in a graceful manner. And um, yeah, I think women in the workplace um, today has changed a great deal, thankfully to the concerted effort, even as it relates to the Me Too movement um, that came from leaders in Hollywood. And I think it has had a ripple effect, or at least I know that it has had a ripple effect because I know people who don't work in Hollywood who speak to the changes that were made. So um, the beautiful thing is that, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel and that we're much stronger together, period. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we are. And I feel like this women are the backbones, whether people give us credit or not, we are so strong to the point where we make other things happen. You know, we, I feel like we're super women, super women. <laughs> um, and like I said, we make it happen. We make it happen. Yeah. Hell or hot water, we make it happen. And yeah. to really know that we have the magic yeah. <laughs> no. and it, it's so important that we recognize that you know uh, like you said a sense of self if yeah. I don't know that I have the magic how are other people supposed to know so that's yeah, super that's... super duper yeah. important yeah. yeah and how does it make you feel emotionally when others try to silence the voice of minorities and women with intimidation or threats uh, well I just Frankly, I've just never been a fan of intimidation. And um, like I was speaking to earlier as related to being charged falsely, you know, charged with a, a felony that clearly we didn't commit um, with my colleagues in protest. I think it was, I think even that was, um, was an act of uh, an attempt to intimidate and it didn't work because <laughs> obviously we went back and obviously we continued to protest on behalf of Breonna Taylor. Um, but I think in general, I think um, intimidation is, is typically uh, reminiscent of an insecurity, a deep insecurity. And when you can identify that and recognize that someone needs to enact intimidation, needs to enact fear tactics upon you as an individual or a group as it relates to African Americans or any any group that is experiencing um, intimidation and, and hate, quite frankly, then I think the best thing you can do is recognize the human experience within that. Um, ironically enough, one of the motifs in our show in the first episode is that is a um, Eldridge Cleaver quote that is a that says the price of hating other human beings is to love yourself less. So you know, never find yourself on the side of hate, and and recognize that if somebody is acting in that way, then that's what they're dealing with. But I think when you know your purpose and you know who you are, and you know why you are, right? And in my I, my case, I, I know I exist because of God. I know I exist because of my ancestors. I am filled in that, in that, um, in that strength, in that power. And there's really, you know, <laughs> I may bend, I may, but I'm not going down, right? Yeah. Um, and and I, I certainly won't cower in the face of intimidation. And I don't think anybody else should. I think that you, you, you grab onto the things that, you, that strengthen you that root you and you can move forward. So, you know, we have to talk a little bit more about this peaceful protest. <laughs> um, okay. You know, um, we have to talk more about, you know, the felony charges and what it was really, really like for you to protest um, for the murder of Breonna Taylor. So many people around the country, they had protests. Some were peaceful, some were not. Um, but what was it like for you personally? What was that experience like? Um, I know that in People Magazine, they said you were a peaceful protester um, and you were arrested and, char and charged. Um, but personally, what was going through your mind in that moment? Um, in that moment that we were arrested, um, what was going through my mind was that this was obviously a unfortunately but but fortunately a very necessary step to take um for what we believed in and what we believed in was that brianna taylor and her family um 
A, that Brianna should be here. She should have been there. She should have been alive. And we, sh and we shouldn't have to be there. But beyond that, because that was not the case, um, we believe that, um, that her family uh, was due a just trial and an unbiased investigation. And um, even in the very experience of how information was being rolled out, it was it was not um, unbiased. It did not appear to be unbiased and it did not appear to be um, transparent for the public and, and or even for her family. So um, it was just a necessary sacrifice ultimately. Um, I, sacrificing our freedom for a few hours <laughs> was, 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 was what it had come to. And um, I think that was pretty much it, you know? I think I was reassured by the fact that the pain that I felt in my apartment alone, just knowing that that happened to someone in this world, knowing that there was a mother and a family that was missing someone because of um, bad behavior, um, neglectful, you know, um, work on behalf of the police department, I, I was reassured that there were other people in the world, in the country, um, that cared enough to, to be there with me getting arrested. So it made sense to me. And um, that's about it. So as a racial equality activist, when did you realize people needed your voice and your courage to stand for justice? Because there were other, you know, celebrities, that, you know, they did get arrested, but when did you realize it was, you know, your voice that the people really needed? Um, you know, I think I realized that um, quite some time ago, actually, and it wasn't when I was a, you know, celebrity, if you will. It was, um, I was, um, you know, I, I, ironically, it happened at the same time where I realized, oh, acting is the thing for me to do. Like it, it is, it is my gift, and I think I feel a calling to to do this thing. And it was a, an experience of doing an improv and telling a story of a young woman via the improv that made a space of people who couldn't be more unlike come together and be very in tune to the story and find similarities amongst themselves because of the story we experience in everybody's the 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 um everybody's uh singular experience of experiencing the story but also people's reflections of their own lives that they saw on the stage that we then talked about after that improv and it was after that improv that i happened to be a part of that i said wow this was really powerful <laughs> and i really enjoyed how we had we went from a, a room of strangers to instant community in that experience so that's part of it and the other part was that um you know in college around the death of trayvon martin um i just found that there was a world out there beyond where i grew up where someone and some people some some people thought it was okay um for somebody to stalk another human being to kill another human being and for there not and for there to be no trial or any charges to be pressed and that was my first experience with that and i couldn't believe that i lived in a world that was like that and i needed to say something and in saying something i found that other people wanted to say something but they weren't saying something so we found community together and then in that i found you know a greater community in in the organizing space um so i think very specifically it was well over 10 years ago that I, I learned that much. So this this was a natural progression that only made sense. Thank you. And my last question, mm -hmm. what could Americans do more of to be more inclusive and diverse? And how can young people help change the course of America? What can Americans do to meet to be more inclusive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then i'll come back to the second question sounds good so 
I think um, what Americans can do to be more inclusive and diverse, open our mouths. <laughs> like the more we share story and yes, story is shared in television and film and that's nice, right? But the more we share with each other um, in our spaces of community and the places where we come out of our homes and interact with strangers, um, whether it's at a park or at um, a concert, you know, whatever it is, um, work, our place of work, um, church. I think the things that bring us together and the more we're able to just share with each other and share our truth, the more we are informed as individuals about people who are not like us. But then we find um, that we're not as dissimilar as we think we are with the people outside of our homes, I think, when we open our mouths. And, and I think a byproduct of that is that then people begin to have the very human experience that is empathizing. I think the internet has allowed us um, to go into worlds and to go into homes and to go into experiences um, in ways that we weren't able to do before. I, obviously, because of that, television and film allows us to do the same thing and i think therefore we're all able to empathize more with the human experience that is not our own um so and i think when empathy checks in and comes into play then i think naturally we become more inclusive we become more inviting i think as human beings and i think our human experience becomes much more rich um and so i think when we share story, when we go seek stories that are not our own, when we go seek experiences that are not our own, I think that's how we create a world that is more inclusive. Um, and then what was your second question? How can young people help change the course of America? Well, I think young people, we, <laughs> God just turned 30, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think young people, so, but, specifically young adults, right? Because I don't, I think I'm officially an adult. I'm not necessarily a young adult. I think we'll, we'll let somebody else judge for that. But I will say that I think young people and specifically um, 25 and younger, let's, talk, let's talk, say 25 and younger, I think are at the forefront of, um, of social change always has always been. There's Joan of Arc, there are the Black Panthers, you know, there are the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, like all young people, um, even the people that went to do the Montgomery bus, bus boycotts were students pr primarily. Um, and, and besides the people that were in the communities. And I think young people have a very necessary voice as it relates to changing America and changing the world around them because they're not jaded by the socialization that comes with being an adult, right? That comes with kind of existing in your own bubble and you go to work and you go home and you go to your same community, this and same neighborhood that, right? And then you suddenly just, you know, um, are not experiencing as much, whereas young people are. And young people are curious and young people um, also have just a very healthy appetite for change and they have a lot of energy. So I think, you know, young people have a very necessary place at the front of a forward movement and change for America. And I think whether they're showing up to spaces on, you know, in protest or whether they're sitting at home, simply imagining the world beyond the protest, right? Simply imagining what we have once, once everybody knows everybody, right? Once we understand what the plights are, how does policing work in the future? You know, how, how, what does sport, what do sports look like that's more inclusive and doesn't exist just simply on a binary of, um, of, of gender, right? So I think when young people put their imagination to work and also put their energy into spaces, they can change anything. And I'm speaking as a former member of the club, so. <laughs> You're most definitely right. You're most definitely right. I thank you so much for this interview. And it has been amazing because you have just, um, you have just shared so much light to, to everyone, you know, not just young people, but everybody. <laughs> everyone. And it makes a big difference to hear someone say, you know what, this is what's going on. This is how we can change it. This is, you know, 
you bring like an awakening to us to say, you know, I, I, I'm woke, you know, mm -hmm. there, there was a thing that said on Twitter, I'm like, you're woke, you know, what's going yeah. on and you're able and you're confident enough to talk about what's going on. And so we need, people like you. You. <laughs> we need people like you to use your voice and everyone, you inspire other people to use their voice too. So I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that, you know, I, I'm ready to speak up on some stuff too. You know, yeah. I can I, I tell my story. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, it's, um, it was such an honor and I hope you have a great day. I wish you much success. Thank and you. I just pray nothing but abundance, love, oh, light, all of that good stuff to you. Thank you. Your words to God's ears and right back to you. I pray for abundance and light and purpose fulfilled. <laughs>